Ron Allen will teach on the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Please follow along with Ron and write down the Bible verses in his presentation. The second book of Thessalonians, chapter 2, is a continuation of Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. In this chapter, Paul addresses concerns regarding the return of Christ and the coming of the Antichrist. Here's an overview of the key points. The Day of the Lord, Paul begins by discussing the Day of the Lord, a significant theme in biblical prophecy referring to the final judgment and culmination of God's plan for humanity. He reassures the Thessalonian believers that this day has not yet come, and it will be preceded by certain events. The Rebellion and the Man of Lawlessness Paul describes a period of rebellion and lawlessness that will precede the coming of Christ. He speaks of a figure known as the Man of Lawlessness or Son of Destruction, who will exalt himself above God and oppose everything related to God. This figure is often interpreted as the Antichrist. Restrainer and Revelation of the Lawless One Paul mentions a restraining force that is currently holding back the revelation of the lawless one. Once this restraining force is removed, the lawless one will be revealed, and his coming will be accompanied by various signs and false miracles. The deception of the lawless one, Paul warns that the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by deception and wickedness, leading many astray. He emphasizes the importance of standing firm in the truth of the gospel to avoid being deceived. God's sovereign plan Throughout the chapter, Paul emphasizes that God is sovereign over all things, including the timing and events surrounding the return of Christ. Believers are encouraged to trust in God's plan and remain steadfast in their faith. Encouragement and Prayer Paul concludes the chapter by offering words of encouragement to the Thessalonian believers, urging them to hold fast to the teachings they have received. He also expresses his gratitude for them and offers a prayer for their strength and encouragement. Overall, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 addresses eschatological themes related to the return of Christ, the rise of the Antichrist, and the importance of remaining faithful amidst deception and persecution. It underscores the sovereignty of God and the need for believers to stand firm in their faith. Here is Ron now with his teaching today. And uh, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 is, uh, is eschatological type. Um, teaching and so in a group like this where you know have people from a lot of different maybe churches and backgrounds you may not all agree you know with uh, with me the way I present it and I don't expect you to but uh, I'll just do uh, the best as I know how in that this morning also I just want uh, I'm just thankful for the pastor for what he did this morning that was really yeah. impressive <laughs> I, uh, just to remember all those words to me is impressive, but uh, he did a good job. I was a little bit worried about the sword, but he handled it, and uh, you know, that, that kind of dangerous thing to fool with, but that was really good, and really gave a good picture of, uh, of the way that all happened at that time, so... Now next Sunday, in case you're confused about it, I mean Easter, we'll still have two services here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there will be a breakfast um, between services and during Sunday school, because there will be no Sunday school class next week in here. So come, come prepared to eat, <laughs> which is what we love to do here, I think. Okay, there's the text is on your table. If you didn't get one, uh, I, I don't know if they all handed out or not. But they, uh, someone can use mine if you don't have one. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, let's uh, begin with prayer. Lord, I uh, lift up my prayer to you this morning because you are the creator of the universe who has created everything seen and unseen and who is all-powerful. And our strength, the strength we need as believers today comes from you, comes from your power in us. 
And we need that in order to uh, live properly and to understand you. And so we ask for this morning for insight and truth as we look at the scriptures to, to have a clear mind and, uh, and pure hearts too as we concentrate on the scripture. And um, just reveal your love to us as you did to the Thessalonian church. And uh, that I know that uh, the Holy Spirit, when bringing the gospel and the truth, especially as what happened in Thessalonica, wants us to be encouraged during times of persecution. And so we need that truth here today as well. So we ask these things, Lord, in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. So those of you who have studied the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, it's really, really intriguing, exciting. Um, the second journey is what brought him to Thessalonica. Remember, he was uh, traveling. He, went, he left Galatia. It's the second time he'd been there he and Silas, and they headed uh, toward the west. And he wanted, Paul wanted to go to Bithynia, which is north, it's up uh, by the sea. And for some reason or other, that was his goal, was to get up there. And remember that in the middle of the night, he has this dramatic um, vision and a man from Macedonia is calling him. He sees, he sees as a vision, the man calling him, come over here and help us. It's like, Dad, come, we need you. It, was, it really touched him, and he changed plans and headed for Macedonia. And so then he went to Macedonia. Remember, in Macedonia, the northern part is where Philippi is. It's right in the northern tip of Macedonia. So they went up to Philippi, and remember who he met there? Who did he meet at Philippi? At, uh, Philippi? That became a first convert. Lydia. Lydia. Yeah, who said that? You? No. no. Helen? Okay, you get an A for that. Uh, but uh, I hate that when a teacher asks you a question like that, because uh, you know what the answer is, but anyway. So then, remember there was this uh, slave girl who uh, was demon-possessed and was gaining money for his owner, her owners, and he cast that demon out, and she did not have the power anymore to tell the future. And so they put, pulled him and Silas up on charges, and they were beaten with rods. Terrible, you know, and then thrown in prison. And uh, then, miraculously, God caused him to escape, and the jailer and uh, his family were all saved, and were, he baptized them there. It was a beautiful story. And I'm sure that when he left there, he was pretty sore, having been beaten with rods. That's a horrible thing. It, sometimes it even broke bones when they would do that. And so... Then they head down to Thessalo, Thessalonica. Thessan, this is the second. Thessalonica. I always get the N and the L mixed up there. Thessalonica was a major city in, in the country of Greece. It was the second major city, the second biggest city. And it had been a city for 350 years when. Paul arrived there, so it was not, nothing new. It was, had a lot of history. If you read the history of Thessalonica, there are a lot of famous people who were there, and some famous philosopher was born there. And, um, but it was named, Thessalonica was named after King Cassandra of Macedonia's wife. Cassandra of Macedonia had a wife, not wife, named Thessalonica. Thessaloniki, and so they named the town 
after her. And she was a half-sister of Alexander the Great. So you have all these in interesting things going there. And um, I, f I found this. Uh, this is a picture of a stone that's in a museum in Thessalonica. And it says, in the language there, it says, uh, to Queen Thessaloniki, daughter of Philip. And so that's, you can actually see that, and that kind of shows that it really was, you know, what they said it was. It was interesting. So, uh, so the city had great history. However, as happened to the older cities, they become really shrouded in darkness, in uh, satanic issues. Um, you know, the Jews, God chose the Jews, Jewish nation, to give the message by word and by deed to the nations around them. And that's what they were supposed to be doing. And there was a Jewish synagogue there in Thessalonica. And, um, and so when he goes, he goes into a really dark area where the gospel since Christ was resurrected has not been preached there. Of course, people have always had the opportunity to be saved from the beginning of time. Um, we've been saved by grace through faith, everyone. Uh, you know, um, Abraham, saved by grace through faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So this has always been the case. However, following Christ's resurrection and his time, uh, much more revelation has been given. So we who live today really have a lot more revelation than Abraham had or any of those people back there. And maybe less of an excuse, right, to uh, miss it. And so it's a blessing for us, but it's also a responsibility for us to have this wonderful news, you know, Amen. already already complete, yeah. tied there up in a go. bow for us. And that's a good thing. Yes. Does it sound okay or? It's just a bit loud. A bit loud, okay. I never was accused of that. Um, I could move it down a little. So uh, now um, Paul went to the Jewish synagogue. He always did that when he went to a town. He went to the Jewish synagogue. Why, why do you think he went to the Jewish synagogue when he went into every town? He loved the Jew brothers. And, and he loved the Jewish people, but what, what advantage would he have by going there? It was a teaching place. Yeah, and usually when uh, when a guest came in in that time, they were allowed. They they gave them the floor. You could you could do the teaching. It was, it was really interesting, and um, so he would always have an opportunity to go there, and then he would begin to prove from the Old Testament, which is all he had, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. That he would be born. That he would die, be, that he would rise from the dead. All those things are taught through the Old Testament. And he proved it. That's what the scripture said, that he would prove it. Um, let me just read some verses from Acts chapter 17. You don't have to go there. Because Acts chapter 17 is where this happened. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, <coughs> He used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I am telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. So people began to be saved there. What a wonderful thing for Thessalonica. But now the Jews become jealous because they see that he's, you know, um, getting a crowd maybe, <laughs> getting a following. 
and uh, they begin to work against him, and he eventually has to leave Thessalonica because it, it was so dangerous for him to stay there. But the salvation experience for the people of Thessalonica who fer- heard, really heard the gospel for the first time was so powerful that they were able to withstand persecution. They were able to uh, grow as a church. And uh, without Paul there, you know, without the master person, teacher there, they, they really, the gospel really grabbed them. I think that that's key thing for Thessalonica. And so uh, it says, so you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. You know, when it says severe suffering, it was, it was hard. They, were, they, they were perhaps were physically uh, badly treated because of this and, and lost, you know, lost jobs and all this and that. They were treated terribly. Persecution, by the way, whenever you hear the word persecution, it means to pursue, to chase. So when people are persecuted, they're chased. They're pushed out of where they live and work and all this sort of thing and go to other countries. Of course, that's how the gospel spread from Jerusalem. Persecution, they were pushed out of Jerusalem. They went up in all these other countries. And um, he says, as a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia, for Wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. That's 1 Thessalonians. I was just reading from um, chapter 1. So they, they had a wonderful faith, and it was being seen by everybody, and that's, that's a great thing. It really is. Now remember, the last phrase I just read here, they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus. Amen. Whom God raised from the dead, he is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of coming judgment. So Paul had taught by divine revelation, because uh, he, he was a prophet. He taught by divine revelation the truth regarding the second coming of Christ. This is things that were really not taught up to that point. And, and so they had this, this pretty specific information, but something happened to them after that. Something brought discouragement. Something brought uh, fear to them. Some false teachers arrived and were teaching false doctrine to them. Now you say, you and I might say, well, just don't listen to them. You know, but this is, it's not that easy. Sometimes when false teachers come or people who proclaim things that are different than what you believe, they are very trustworthy people yeah. sometimes. sometimes. They're people who sense. are known by others as good people and so forth. And so we have a tendency sometimes to, to listen. And, uh, and that's what we pick up in our lesson here today on the sheet that you have. We're going to be beginning here verse number one in chapter two. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. This is what he had taught them already. But somehow those specifics didn't get back to us. So there, there needs to be clarification here. And so he said, let me clarify this. Some people read that and they say, I'm still confused. But let's look at it. Verse 2, don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them 
Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision. No. Oh, and that's what often happens. Uh, people claim these, these supernatural things. Um, or a revelation or a letter supposedly from us. Now, it's easy for them to believe there could be a revelation because there were revelations during that time. The Bible was not complete. You know, people were teaching. And so um, they even were t telling him that Paul has written a letter that, telling you this, that the rapture's already happened. So, so and they were, they were frightened. They were, they were scared. Verse 3 says, don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. So he says, don't be easily shaken. And that can be for us today too, is to not be shaken up by things. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of false teachings as we progress forward to the coming. Don't believe them. He said, don't be fooled. So those three things in that verse. That day, the day of the Lord, they thought had already begun. So what's the day of the Lord? Um, let's look at this. This is the way I've been taught about this. And um, so you can disagree, and I, I won't be mad or anything. Okay, I will be with friends and all this and that. But um, the day of the Lord, I believe, starts with the rapture of the church. When, um, you know, when the, we're caught up to gather Christians dead and alive, are caught up. That's what rapture means. Caught up, it's Latin for catch away. We're caught up. And we meet the Lord in the air. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 teaches that. You, most of you are familiar with it, are you not? Yes. And, um, and then it continues, I believe, it continues through the seven literal years of tribulation on the earth. That's continuously the day of the Lord. It continues through the battle of the Armageddon and the coming of Jesus, where the battle takes place, right? At the end of the tribulation. I believe the day of the Lord continues all the way through the thousand years of the millennium and through the to the great white throne judgment. Okay. Now if you don't believe that, that's fine. I mean it's not going to make any difference actually it, whether you believe that we, you have that same sequence anyway. It's going to happen, you know. But, um, but the Christians in Thessalonica and this is the important part have been hoodwinked into actually believing that the rapture of the church has already occurred and they missed it. Try to imagine that as you sit here today. Try to imagine um, really strong information and strong teaching that, hey, we missed it. I mean, what would it, what would it feel like really? Just think about that because the Bible of Titus, I think, uses the words blessed hope. The blessed hope is the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's our hope. And you miss it? Oh, they were really bad in bad shape because of that. It's very frightening. So in verse 3 of our text, Paul says that there are two good reasons why you must understand that the rapture has not yet occurred. Don't be fooled by what you say, verse 3. What they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God. That's the first one. And that the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. First of all, a great rebellion against God. Um, when will that occur? I personally believe that it will occur after the rapture, uh, after the church is gone, after the Spirit of God who lives in the bodies of believers has gone. And it's not here anymore. It will be a world of such heinous, just hate 
and evil and murder, the likes of which has never been seen on the earth. And we've seen some bad stuff. I mean, I, I, I can't watch Fox, Fox News all the time anymore. I used to watch it all the time. But I get, I don't get depressed, but I get, I just, it, it, it hangs heavy on you, you know. And I, I know there's nothing I can do about it. You know, I mean, I can't change what's happening there. Pray, of course, but um, bad stuff's happening in our world all over. It always has. But uh, after the rapture of the church, it, it's going to be a world so bad that we, we probably couldn't even imagine in our minds how bad it's going to be. So here's my belief about this. My belief is that there will be an enormous number of religious people who are not genuinely saved. An, an enormous number of religious people Let's say people who go to church, people who maybe talk to talk, but are not born again. They are not genuine Christians. And, and uh, after the rapture, they will, they will turn against anything that's called God. They will rebel against God. There will be a great falling away. And if you live to see that, then you've missed the rapture of the church, is my belief. So the great rebellion is number one. Now, I know, I know uh, there are some of you probably who might think differently on that. That's fine. But um, the reason I feel it's after the rapture is this. If the great rebellion occurred, then you would know within a narrow amount of time when the rapture was going to occur, Right? Because the rebellion happened. If it happened, you say, well, it's going, the rapture is going to occur, right? You look kind of blank, so I'm not, I'm not getting across what uh, I think. Maybe I'm not saying it right. But if this happens before the rapture, then you're going to know pretty much that the rapture is going to occur pretty quick. We're not supposed to know that. The Bible says that at that time we don't know. It's a secret. His coming is a secret. And if this happens before, then we'll know, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Does that make sense or not? Okay. So, uh, secondly, so we, we got that out of the way. The, the great rebellion, there will be a rebellion that we won't be a part of because we'll be gone. The second thing is the man of lawlessness, which is the Antichrist. He's called the Antichrist. He's got called a lot of things in the Bible. And uh, he's a terrible person. More evil than any person who's ever lived on the face of the earth. And yet he will be able to cause religious people to change their minds. These are the religious people who were not saved, who were living during yeah. the tribulation they'll be easily drawn to what he says. For one thing, he doesn't believe in the law. So you do whatever you want. Yeah. So he's a lawless person. Yeah. And I believe he could be alive in the world right now. I believe the Antichrist could be in the world right now uh, if the rapture is going to occur soon. He could be alive now. And... Um, Daniel, when he spoke of him in Daniel 9, he said he called him the prince who is to come. In Daniel 8, he called him the king of fierce countenance. I just thought that was kind of an interesting uh, thing, a visual idea of him. The king of fierce countenance. Be someone you would not want to meet in a dark alley or anywhere, I guess. Daniel 11, said he's called the willful king. If you see these things happening, then you have missed the rapture of the church. If you, if you see the Antichrist. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, now look what it says about the Antichrist. Verse 4. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God. 
and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Now remember, I think hundreds of thousands of people who were left behind because they didn't genuinely believe God will be in that group. Why were they left behind? Because they didn't believe God. You have to believe God to be saved. You do not believe. You're not saved. Amen. So, they were not true believers. Now notice that it says that he will sit in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. But there is no temple today, right? There's no temple. We're, we're, what's at the temple site? The mosque. Yeah, the mosque is there. Been there a long time. There's no temple. And yet he's going to sit in a temple. So what's that tell you about time and timing and so forth? Um, in verse 5, he said, don't you remember I told you, you all about this when I was with you? I wish I had a recording of that teaching yeah. that he was teaching them at that time. So Paul has taught this new revelation to the people of Thessalonica, but we all forget, you know, the things we've been taught. I do, anyway. Teacher, look at me, why didn't you remember that? I spent two hours teaching you. And I have to come back and look at it again, you know. And so verse 6, and you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. Now let me back up just a second, because you guys are all people who are pretty well read, I think, on things. And how many of you have read about a new temple in Jerusalem? What, what have you read? Have you read anything uh, pretty current? They have, well, they had most of the things that they need, including that, uh, a quick, um, what do you call it, all the building blocks. Everything is, is ready to go. Yeah. Have you all heard that? Did you hear what he said? The, uh, back in 1987, this group actually started that uh, the temple, they, they had the... They were cutting stones. They also were training priests. They've been training priests since that time. Um, they don't know for sure the things I read about. Don't know sure who is related to Aaron. I guess that'd be hard to find out now. But um, so I guess there's this idea that uh, they can build this thing pretty fast. Yes. Yes, there are some rabbis in the leadership of the Israel that say. It doesn't necessarily have to be up there on the mountain next to the mosque. Yeah, yes. There are other locations that yeah. will work. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I drive a bus around all these places, and I drive by all these places where they're building new buildings. I'll drive down this road in the country, and all of a sudden there's some little red flags out there. Two or three days later, there's a bulldozer out there. Two days later, there's streets cut in to the pasture. A few days later, they're laying foundations. I mean, within weeks, they're building houses, you know. So I, I can't imagine that the temple probably cannot be built pretty quickly in this day and age, if that was the case. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And so let's look now, verse 6 again. And you know what's holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. That's the, the Antichrist who's holding him back. What is holding the Antichrist back? The Holy Spirit. God. Holy Spirit? Okay. The Holy Spirit Yes. Yes. I believe it's God uh, through his spirit, through working through his church, the believers, today. Yes. We are the ones who um, are the salt of the earth. You know, we are the ones who are the light of the world. Um, we're the ones who are um, hopefully uh, causing people to think twice before they do the evil things that they do. 
Um, that's how I see it. That has to be God, like some of you said, by his spirit through the church. Verse 7 says, For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one is holding it back steps out of the way. And um, so the evil is caused by the satanic forces. But brother and sister, the spirit of God living in you is multiplied Pow many times more powerful than Satan. All right? Yes. Satan has power, but, but he's no match for the Spirit of God. So, um, verse 8 says, Then the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This is a, this is a picture, of, a quick picture of the tribulation period, all in one sentence. Um, he'll, Lord Jesus will slay him, and that's at the end of the uh, tribulation period at the battle. And that will be the end of the seven years tribulation. Verse 9, this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love <clears throat> and accept the truth that would save them. Every kind of evil deception. And see, these people have already denied Christ who are living during that time. And... Um, so they'll be easily deceived into, in other ways as well. Those are the folks who did not believe, but played the game of church. Verse 11. <clears throat> Just a second. I'm going to take a drink of Vern's coffee. <laughs> Good luck. It has some magic in it that does something. You know. <laughs> Verse 11. <clears throat> So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. <clears throat> so that's a picture of um, what's going to happen. And uh, so as believers, he tells us to stand firm. If you don't mind, I'm going to get my iPad out because I, my, I, couldn't, I couldn't get my notes printed. They wouldn't work. My printer didn't work. And uh, I promised myself one time I would never teach or preach from an iPad. <laughs> there just seems to be something, something artificial about it. I don't know what it is. You just won't preach. I'm just old-fashioned, you know. So, all right. So, at this point, now Paul is going to talk to us about hanging on to the truth, standing firm in what we believe. This is what he wants to tell us now. And um, uh, verse 13 he says, as for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters loved by the Lord. I'm going to talk about that in a minute because that phrase just grabbed me when I was studying this. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in the Amen. truth. <clears throat> I just, I really spent a lot of time thinking about the love of God. Uh, you know, with all this talk right now about April 8th, what's going to happen April 8th? Eclipse. Eclipse of the sun. It really makes people crazy. Uh, all kinds of weird things and ideas. People go down there and they spend five grand over a hotel room. And... But 
I was thinking about our universe. I was trying to imagine God's love and how enormous God's love is for us. How great it is. And um, so I, I thought about the greatness of God. One way we can see it is in his creation of the universe. Um, I never read this before, so this is new to me. Some of you scientists, there will be no problem for you. But there's something out in space called millisecond pulsars. So everybody shook their head no? Mark, you should know. You know about them. Um, a gigantic star millions of light years away explodes in a huge supernova. It creates a fireball 10 million billion billion times bigger than the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. Wow. 10 million billion billion. Wow. I don't know what that is. <laughs> After a while it just really big, you know. <laughs> and so in its ashes, it leaves behind a neutron star made of dense atomic nuclei squashed together at a density of 10 trillion times greater than steel. I mean, that's just, I, I can't imagine. The way to imagine that is if you take a spoonful of a neutron star, it weighs more than the Earth. All right. All right. And, I, and it says there a teaspoonful of neutron star weighs about... Um, yeah, have you here? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you come and finish this part of it for me. No, but uh, but sometimes this neutron star will steal matter from a nearby star and start spinning. Some neutron stars spin hundreds of times a second. A whole star rotating as fast as an idling car engine. Many of these super dense rebut revving stars send out pulses of electromagnetic radiation milliseconds apart. We could use these millisecond pulses as standard clocks to help us detect gravitational waves and blah, blah, blah. So when I was thinking about the love of God, I began to look, read how big space is. And you've all read some of these things yourself. Um, and Ephesians has this great verse two verses. In Ephesians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19. Some of you may have memorized them. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide how long how high how deep His love is. Amen. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes through God. And so, in that verse, there <clears throat> he says, um, he sa um, As for we can't help, thank you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Why did he put that in there? Loved by the Lord. And, um, and, and begin, begin to think that it's his love. It's his love that has so much to do with everything we, salvific, everything salvation. His love, the love of him drew us to himself. And, uh, and so, so with that in mind, I, I was trying to think of the enormity of God and of his love. That's why I looked into this. And this guy, now I've never heard of a SR-71 Blackbird, but it's an airplane of some kind. And it goes really, really fast. One of the fastest in the world. And he says, now imagine you could uh, speed it up to a hundred times. Anyway, he goes on to explain how far away the edge of the universe is. I mean, going at the fast as you could go uh, to get to the center of the Milky Way galaxy, 80 million years, mm -hmm. traveling in the fastest plane, to the next closest galaxy, 7 billion years, 
to the edge of the visible universe 40 million million years. Anyway, <clears throat> so um, can you comprehend no. how much God loves you? That's the question. That's right. Can we comprehend how much he loves us? How wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 31, 3, Long ago the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. So Paul reminds the Thessalonians, you're loved by God, and we should be reminded often of us as well. Love by the Lord. And see, he loves us so much that we as people, no matter how good we are, and there's good people in this room, we, we still can look at people and, and judge them, you know. We can be judgmental about who will do this, who will attain this, who will do this and that. We, we, it's hard to get over that. With, with Christ, with God, He loves every person He ever Amen. created. Amen. Every person. There are no throwaway every people. Person. No throwaway people. No, no matter what's wrong with them or anything like this, God's love is for all. And he, so he says to them, loved by God, we, he wants us to think about this, to think about the fact that it's his love that drew us and he loves us. Friends, listen. As a pastor, over years of time, many times I've counseled Christian people who do not believe that God loves them. They just can't grasp the fact that they could be loved because their lives have been full of sin and these kinds of things. And, uh, but he loves with immeasurable intensity every person that has ever been created. You only understand that. And if we believe that, then we must love the people that he has created. Just think of his creation, for instance. Um, for instance, birds. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 10, What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Yes. Do you ever think about that? Yes. I, I went on, I tried, to find, I tried to find out how many birds there are in the world. And the, the people, you know, they have a vast different. One said 40 billion. One said 140 billion. But anyway, just imagine that. There, let's say there's 100 billion birds in the world. And one falls down and dies. He knows. He knows that one. He knows that one, you know. Uh, and he cares. He cares. In my elder, older days, I've changed a lot. I, when I was young, I was a hunter. I hunted squirrels. I remember hunting with my grandpa. My grandpa, and I, would, I was the one that had to walk around the tree so the squirrels would move, and he would shoot them, you know. <laughs> but I remember after a few years of hunting, and one, I was hunting with my grandpa, and I shot a squirrel. And I went over and I, I put my foot down because I didn't make sure it was dead, you know. And I rolled it over. And it was a nursing mother. Oh. And it hit me all of a sudden. I said, what am I doing, you know, here? Because there's some babies up there that's not going to get any milk. You know, and I know it's wimpy. That is for a, for a hunter. You, you don't think that way, you know. But... Um, I think that way I'm driving down the road and I see these poor creatures that are smashed by a car and I sometimes they say, I know, Lord, you love that little creature. Uh, even if it's one of those with the back, armadillo, you know, all of them, you know. 
and uh, but he loves them all. And so he says, you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Why would he say, don't be afraid? He says, don't be afraid. Because in our sinful condition, we are prone to devalue ourselves and to begin to think, how could he love me? How could he love me? And if you're here this morning and you have that idea or attitude or feeling, remind yourself again, as Paul was reminding these new believers, loved by God. <laughs> Believe it. Every word of it. Don't be afraid. God will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. And it's the love of God that draws people to his kingdom. So I just, that just really caught me. I didn't have time to um, go farther, but let me just say this before I get the end, because it's important here in verse 15 of your text, because here's what Paul wants us to do because there are people out here who want to fool us into thinking their Dave Lord's already happened and because we have this wonderful salvation that he talks about in this verse 13 verse 15 says with all things in mind dear brothers and sisters stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching we pass on to you, both in person and in letter. And that's what he wants for us here today. Stand firm. Keep a strong grip on the teaching we pass on to you. And that's what he wants us to know. And personally, and you could probably tell stories to you, I've seen people who I would believe would never be saved. My first church was a church plant, and um, we helped these families out. You know, we'd take groceries to this mobile home park to this family, and uh, just everyone in the family was really had trouble. The father was gone. Teenage daughter never spoke or never smiled. The little boy was uncontrollable. And uh, so we would go to there and we'd bring them groceries and talk to them and um, take them places. But one day, uh, the teenage daughter showed up in, in my church. She was sitting about, I can remember, about halfway down and toward the middle. She never smiled. She uh, was still kind of pale. And she came. She started coming week after week to church. And... Uh, then we moved on to our next ministry. Well, say 20 years later, at least, up in the 2000s, there we had phones and computers and stuff. I get this message from her. She says, are you the Pastor Ron that was in Erie at the, such a time? And so I got on and I got back to her. I said, yeah, I, I'm the one. And she says, I need to talk to you. So we connected by phone, and she was not, I, could, I couldn't believe it was the same person. You know, she was bubbly and smiley. She says, one morning in the service, you said that if you'd like to believe Christ and receive him just where you're sitting, sitting uh, do that. And she says, I did that. But then you left, she said. And anyway, she says, I'm married to a youth pastor. I have two kids, I live in California, and it was such an amazing thing, but you know what drew her? The love of God. Amen. It was the love of God, Amen. not just for me, from me. Amen. The people of our church were amazing. Yes. Yes. They would go and do everything to help this family who could do nothing for them in return. And she saw love in action, you know, <clears throat> she saw it happen. She saw a core. You know, yeah. what we have here. And that caused her to believe and receive Christ as her Savior. Anyway, um, was our time up? Yeah, it is. Oh, did you want to make an announcement? Uh, sorry. Oh, you already did it. I did when you were out of the room. Oh, okay. Anyone have a, a comment or anything before we...
shows up. So. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Why were the Jews so threatened by Paul in which to the synagogue and teach? He had a reputation. No, why was the why was the um, why was the, the Jewish synagogue so threatened by Paul? I mean, I know Paul was a leader, he used to be a leader, and he stepped down. But well, he taught something they weren't teaching. He taught that there was uh, that the Messiah had come, and they were teaching the Messiah had not had come. So that was as a cross purposes. I also think, to me, and I don't know that's true, but I think jealousy partly was he was reasonably successful. People he got it gained a following, where the I'm sure the synagogue had the same people every week. You know. That's the only answer I could give. Anyone else? Yes, sir. If we are not open to God's love, we're going to miss it. Don't miss it. Thank you. Very good. I appreciate that. Very much. Well, thank you, you guys, for your attentiveness. And um, I hope I didn't fool with your doctrine on eschatology, but whatever. <laughs> I would love to hear if you have any differences. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, I just thank you uh, this morning for... Uh, well, look for, for the, the folks who have gathered here, folks who love you and who love your word. And uh, I pray that um, even maybe just a little bit more this morning, we might um, think about or um, experience in some unique ways your wonderful uh, exponentially enormous love in our lives and uh, that that we all need Lord so I pray that that would be the case and I, I, I ask your blessing on the folks in this room too and that you would answer their prayers today in Jesus name Amen, amen.